We're at Monza for the opening round of the Blancpain GT Series for 2019. It's the first Endurance Cup race, and this pre-qualifying <coughs> session is already underway. It lasts for 90 minutes, and this could be all important because weather for tomorrow is predicted to be wet, and it could be that it's so wet in the morning that the cars can't even go out and qualify, in which case the grid would have to be based on the times in this session. So there's more importance than ever. Teams are looking at running new tyres in this, which otherwise will be earmarked for qualifying. It's going to be fascinating to see what develops in the next 90 minutes. David Anderson and John Watson, trackside. And John, you've been looking forward to this all day. Well, it's going to be, in my view, probably the key session up to the point where the qualifying is due to take place, which would be on Sunday morning. Now, the weather that we've been talking about, we talked about it earlier in the morning, we're talking about it again. I've had a straw pull up and down the pit lane, and the consensus is that actually the biblical rain that we were predicting 24 hours ago to fall over 4 a.m. Sunday yeah. morning all the way through Sunday is reducing and reducing and reducing. And that's kind of throwing a spanner in the works of many of the teams in the pit lane, because had that weather pattern been consolidated, unquestionably, many of the teams that are, certainly the pro teams, would have run more than one set of the dry Pirelli tyre, because that's where they were going to end up with the grid. The grid would have, if it had been no qualifying or restricted qualifying, it would have been certainly, that would have been the formation of the grid. Now, teams are thinking, well, it looks like we will have qualifying. It will be wet, but it will be drivable wet. It'll not be a flood proportions. So some might just do it, get a banker in, in the event that the forecast reverts back to what was originally being suggested would be weather conditions on Sunday morning. It's going to be interesting, isn't it? Certainly, because some teams are going to gamble on the weather going either way. But this pre-qualifying session then is for 90 minutes. You see the tyres being swapped over. Yeah, and those look pretty fresh to me. Yeah. Now, we had a funny old session for free practice earlier on because we had, what, three interruptions, and we never really got going with times, although, I grant you, it wasn't about doing a good lap. This is. But are we going to see anything like the same pattern from this morning being replicated in this? I rather doubt it, to be fair. Well, I think everybody who will start the session on a fresh set of tyres will get their best laps in early into that run. Those that opt to put on a new set of dry weather slick tyres towards the end of the session to get that banker lap in will suddenly find themselves up the timing. I mean, you, you could be running maybe outside the top 20 on a set of race tyres, running a lap time, which would be a very competitive race lap time. But because you may not want to start outside the top 20 for all the obvious reasons of traffic and potentially visibility if the track would be wet at the start of a race, so therefore, one or two, or maybe more of the teams will take... Well, that, that's it's a gamble. Yeah. It's a gamble. The prospect of it being dry Sunday morning is, is minuscule. The prospect of it being drivable wet, nearly 100%. So the grid ultimately will be resolved in a wet qualifying practice Sunday morning, and all this will have been for nothing in effect. Well, right now, Seb Morris for Team Parker Racing is the fastest in the Pro-Am uh, Bentley, a 1 minute 48.956. Now, the best we had in free practice was a 47.7 from Marcus Winkelhock. So it's Seb Morris from Klaus Battler, and then Matt Campbell in the Rover Racing Porsche. Porsche second and third behind Bentley at the moment, because Klaus Battler also is Porsche mounted. Now, that day, the Seb Morris Bentley in that session this morning did a time exactly one second quicker than his current fastest time uh, as we stand just, what, two laps and a bit? Uh, we've got an hour and 21 minutes of this one-and-a-half-hour session remaining. There's Winkelhock, who was good, as I say, this morning. Seb Morris, 48.956, the top time. What does Winkelhock do as he breaks the beam? He does a 51.106. It's a fairly gentle start on that. Dries Van Thor, though, is fourth fastest. Now Winkelhock goes sixth, 150.040. But I'm not seeing any purples coming up in our timing and scoring. Seeing a lot of greens being personal bests. So, again, the tyre that people are on is most likely... Well, there's a fresh set of tyres, sticker tyres being put on. Now, somebody thinks this is the right time to do that. That's... I'm trying to recognise the idea of these new WRT <laughs> colours. 
That, I think, is the 17 car that Paul Petit was tapped into a spin with in free practice. Alex McDowell uh, is shown as being behind the wheel of that car at the moment. And the Australian, Shay Davis, coming from Porsches in Block Pan GT Series Asia, is the third driver. In my travels around the paddock, I did actually bump into Yuzuki, El Perez Compact. Uh -huh. And I said, oh, what's it like driving the same engine, same transmission, but in an Audi aerodynamics? He's very happy. I should think there so. Are, there are a number of driver changes that have taken place over the wintertime. His being one of them. Delighted to be a part of the WRT team. Well, he's no slouch, and he's in a good team. As there, another of the WRT fleet arrives. That's the Charles Vietz car, which he shares with Rick Brokers and Ricardo Sanchez. Good combination of drivers there. It's going to be another one to keep an eye to over the course of the weekend. James Paul for Barwell has just gone third. As there you see the number 25, Santa Lock, Stephen Palat driven Audi going through. Now, Stephen Palat, somebody that we saw last, really, yes, in the GT4 in Bahrain, doing a good, a good feisty job. Uh, indeed, I mean, one of the drivers of the weekend and player, in a, my opinion, and now in the sort of the, the big brother to that GT4 Audi. So 25 or 26, the Santa Lock. Oh, Ooh. look at that. Letting the back drift that, that is indicative of not overdriving, but maybe as the fact that the tyres have done a, a fair number of laps and not, there's not a huge amount of grip there. So oversteer on the edge of a parabolica is not something you normally expect to see, no. but that was a clear example of how much grip was available at the rear of the 25. Again, even under braking into the first chicane, the car looking not particularly stable or comfortable. Uh, more opposite lock than Santa lock, wasn't it that? But the uh, the old ones are still the best, David. The old ones are still the best. Absolutely, John. He got away with it and is currently 14th fastest. Why is he 14th? Who's gone quicker? Andrea Rizzoli uh, has just been discovered and put into the times. Well up. So as the session continues, the Team Parker Racing Bentley, the fastest by 54 thousandths at the moment. Yeah, again, all these fastest laps were done relatively early into the stint, second and third lap. In the case of the Parker Bentley, it was on the third lap. We've got a purple. Jules Gugnon has done a purple. He's currently in sixth place in the Bentley number 107. So purple of sector one, Jules Gugnon. So maybe we're going to see a time beginning to get close to what we had some few hours earlier. Quickest time overall was the 26 idea. Marcus Finkelock won 47.720, and just to round out the top 24, we're all covered by just under one second. <sighs> I mean, I don't know why it's not more competitive. <laughs> They're just not trying, are they? Up the curb, Jules Gounod is certainly trying hard in the 107 Bentley. If you're wondering why they're 107 and 108 this year rather than 7 and 8, it's because this is Bentley's centenary year. So to celebrate that, they run with the 100 prefix. And he's going to be slightly... That, that's the Chris Bunkham, I think. Ferrari, uh, I don't know who's behind the wheel of it currently. Uh, 93 it is, isn't it? And that means... Look up without the order. Chris Bunkham. Chris behind the wheel. Chris, of course, close to... Let's see what he does. Coming to the ship, go quickest, in my view. He goes third. I'm surprised. Personal best in second and third sector. Fastest overall first sector. I thought that might have been a time that would have put him to the top of the timing and scoring. But Chris Bunkham, of course, big mate, Jensen's closest male buddy, is uh, keeping a hand and an eye over the Bob Neville entered Honda, which is part of what they, I think, euphemistically call Jensen Team Rocket, RJN. I mean, it sounds almost... He's been totally Japanese. <laughs> I was going to say that, yes, it's a very Japanese sounding well, team. Jensen racing out in the Far East yeah. this weekend, happened to be third quickest in his Honda oh, okay. NSX, and who are pole position but to Nissan. Ah. Sadly, not here this weekend. No, indeed, and their drivers of years past across different cars. We mentioned Ricardo Sanchez, Alex Bunker, he's now a Bentley boy. And apparently blending in very well Good. indeed. Good. So the word on the street, or the back of the pit lane anyway. So maybe Alex Bunkin might find himself driving into a more permanent seat. This is only a one-off at the minute, I understand. So there may be something even more available if there was an opportunity. 
doesn't Alex Buncombe have a son called Morgan? And he might have to be renamed if he's a Bentley boy now, if Dad's a Bentley boy. Uh, well, I hope he hasn't got an Ash friend. <laughs> He could, called, he could be called Ash, couldn't he? <laughs> True enough, I guess. Now, there, for Rinaldi Racing, is the 333 Ferrari, which currently is being driven by David Perel, the South African. Quick racer in South Africa many years ago, ran out of money, founded an IT company with his brother, saved a lot of money, came back to Europe and loves this series. That's the quickest way to... <laughs> well... If you've got a hobby and you're prepared to invest in it, what yeah. better can you do than support them I mean, in a great car, the 333 team, Ronald, um, Ronaldi Racing. And uh, they've had that number, I mean, since I can remember, GT3. Yeah. Yes, you always know where to look when you see a green Ferrari in the entrance. Yes, 333. Yeah. And I suppose in this type of racing, whereas because it's not a single driver category, you can't really allocate a number to a driver. You can to a team. You get used to seeing Bentley 7 and 8, Rinaldi triple 3. So there towards the end of the back straight comes David Perel. The South African hits the brakes down to third gear, turns through the new graphics, the new telemetry we've yep. got, giving an idea of the speed of the gears. Excellent innovation. Yes, and I'm really interested in the speed in particular, just to get an idea of which of these cars is the quickest in a straight line, indicate maybe is it an aerodynamic reason, or is the, the car is a physically smaller car than some of the competition? In the meantime, the 90 Mercedes uh, has gone Felipe Fraga, the Brazilian driver, very, very capable indeed. There we see it, 28 going to come across the finish line. Is it going to go quickest? But yes, finally, wow. somebody is disposed to send Morris from that position, that provisional quickest position. So Fraga, Timo Bogoslavski and Nico Bastian, interesting combination. But more track, Marcus Winkelhoff is on the charge in the 26 ID, fastest overall sector one purple. See what he's going to do in sectors two and sector three. The Felipe Fraga in the number 90 Mercedes, there it is, thundering its way around. Curva Grande, as it was known. Magnificent corner. When you approach that corner without any chicanes, as in the good old days, yes. the old boys did. <laughs> now, that's a challenge. That is a challenge. It was a challenge. No ABS, no traction control, limited runoff. Marcus Winkelhock oh, is about Fraga. to get to the end of the lap. Fraga get up the curb. Right, there's Winkelhock getting past the Honda we were talking about earlier on. Who's driving the Honda at the moment? Stuart Moore. Race pace, very good, I gather, from the Honda right on the money so they didn't go after a time this morning they were going after set up and made a few changes so Finkelhock comes across the line and where does he go quick gears but also Dries Van Thor is on the money he's done an absolute best in the middle sector but he only stays third 148 364 two tenths back as up behind the Gulf Racing liveried Porsche goes Finkelhock that's Jordan Brogar on the wheel of it Brogar's car with uh, Benjamin Goethe at the wheel was in the gravel in free practice one of the three uh, incidents that cause the flags, the red flags to fly. So Marcus Winkelhock giving them the hurry up with the... You're only allowed to flash a limited number of times. Obviously, Marcus Winkelhock isn't uh, prepared and he tried to... He knew that he wasn't far enough alongside. He tried to pull him, the Porsche, into conceding the corner, but it didn't work. Now, gets up alongside and down the inside into Lesma 1. Frustrating because Winkelhock went offline, down the inside, the car got a little unstable on the exit, you saw the tail of the car waggling around. So this lap will not be any improvement, but at least he has now got clear air, which is what he'll be looking for. Now there is Winkelhock, speed building, so yeah, this lap might be a bit of a write-off, given that he got stuck, but the next one could be interesting. And who's driving the Honda, did we say? Because it's going rapidly, it's true and more. 30 if he is at the moment. There in the pit lane is the Attempto, Audi. Tires being changed. The way they've altered the aero in the front of the car compared to what we saw previously, there's revisions around the headlight and the front aero dam. And it is becoming it's the nose of all these GT cars are all becoming very similar. Mm. I mean I look at the front of that, you look down the road at an Aston Martin, and initially you'd think, well, where's the difference? Now, the Attempto team 
race winners last year in what was then known as the Sprint Cup. And Mattia Drudi behind the wheel. Bottle of Barwell Motorsport Lamborghini 77. Just looking to see where that is, if they're registered in the top 30 is Miguel Ramos. So down into Lesma 1. Now Ramos is hugely experienced, yeah. isn't he? Adrian Amstutz back up his big accident at Spa two years ago, came back last year. And Leo Machitsky is the third driver, the Russian driver. Mark Lever's team, Barwell Motorsport. And Ramos, fifth fastest at the moment. That's a good run. It is. Very good run. Dries van Thor, another personal and another absolute best as the Barwell Lamborghini comes up towards the Variante Ascari. Mark Lever, quite confident with the, the prospects of his team. I've done a lot of work and uh, again ask the question what are you going to do you're going to run one or two sets of tires and i mean you get a straight answer eyeballs roll skyward as if to say well you tell me look at the bentley behind weaving around warming up the tires as they that's van tour and he's got quickest 148042 dries van four ahead of marcus winkelhock so it's audi's first and second it's mercedes third and fourth because fourth is tom onslow cole in a pro-amp car. Uh, Rick Broker's Audi is fifth. Miguel Ramos, Lamborghini, sixth. Seb Morris, seventh for Bentiano. Santamato, eighth for Lamborghini. Andrea Rizzoli for Porsche is ninth. And Jules Gounon, Bentley, is tenth. So a bit of a mixed bag, which is very good. It is, isn't it? But, but no Ferraris up there yet. No, but we've only got the top ten currently covered by that one second. Unlike what we saw this morning, where we had 24 cars covered by a single second. So three spun four just getting better and better as he matures. And one would assume now that he's almost considered to be the senior driver within the WRT driver lineup. I would think In terms of pace right. yes, and that's right. the growing experience. Yeah, I mean, he, he is in the lead car, and if you take Compact out of the equation, because he's not driven for them yet, against Alex Riveras, yeah, Dries Van is probably yeah. the, the slightly quicker. Yeah. So, yes, it always used to be his brother that was the benchmark WRT driver. WRT, of course, going into the DTM this year as well. That's still got this GT program. And Dries Van Thor a bit stuck in the traffic this time. He just needs to be a little bit patient. He's going to slip out, dive down the inside. He thinks, yep, he's been given the track space. Uh, well, oh. maybe, it, maybe it wasn't. He was, <laughs> it looked like a little bit of confusion. I think he thought, no, 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 OK, yes, I will. But then he was compromised because he was so tight on the entry. Car, again, as we've seen from Audi's, the back end stepped out. Of course, then the Lamborghini hadn't maybe appreciated that Van Thor was going to come through. And then he had to take somewhat of a step to the left to avoid any contact. That was Stefano Catuzzo that was the other driver involved in all of that. Oh, where are you off to now, Dries? Uh, that's the waste of a, a lap. Yeah, up the escape road, back on. So yes, that lap gone. Is it worth staying out, or is it now time to bail and put somebody else in the car? I would have thought, having had that little aero down at the first chicane, he's going to have to come back before he can go on to another flying lap. In that case, maybe just come in, you've got Riveras, or Ezekiel Perez Compact, who could get behind the wheel. And then at the end of the session, should WRT deem it a worthwhile gamble, put three span four out on a brand new set of rubber just in the event that what we don't know is going to happen on Sunday morning should or not happen. Now there is another of the WRT uh, fleet. That's the car that's now fourth. Rick Brokers at the wheel of number 10. This, we understand, is going to be a totally dry session, so we don't need to fret about the weather until tomorrow, but the teams have got plan A, plan B, plan C, and they've probably got the same in race control. Broker's made a name for himself when he first came into the Lamborghini Super Trofeo. He's racing Le Mans, he's racing Lamborghinis in all sorts of uh, continents, in 
where Lamborghini championships happen. A lot of races in the Preventing 24-hour series as well, in which his family is an investor, but good to see him in this, racing at this level. Well, currently fourth quickest, can be expected to change in time on 48.4, so that last that 48 tenth of a second done. So that's you know, reasonable, I think, under the circumstances. The Garage 59 Aston Martins, which takes an awful lot of getting used to after all these years, are 30th and 35th. 30th is where you find Chris Goodwin, and 35th is Johnny Adam. But you get the feeling they've not unlocked something yet in those cars. I would agree with that. Uh, I think the Aston Martin, both the R Motorsport and the Garage 59 entries in particular, two very, very well-run teams, both capable of winning, both have got a history of winning. So it's down to them just literally, as you call it, unlocking the performance as oh. one of the Ferraris goes around on the exit of Lesbo 2. That's going to be a red flag, surely, isn't it? 444 is off the road. And look, oh, and that looks oh, going no. on. That, was that contact or was that cause and effect? Because the 333 Ferrari, the rear wing, the front, so this will be a red flag. Yes, the red flag has been. Did the, the this Ferrari, the 444, go off as a consequence of what happened to the 333? We only saw the 444 as it bounced across the gravel, and then when the camera went wide, there's the 333. So that's going to be a lot of time to get those two cars removed, but yeah. particularly the 333, which has got a lot of damage on that right, left rear, uh, and bodywork you can see scattered across the racetrack. So 444 is Florian Schultzer, new to the Blancpain series, but we've seen him in Lamborghini Super Trofeo winning his uh, class. And the red flag is caused by Schultzer in Trouble 4 and Trouble 3, uh, which is being driven by Denis Bulatov. But they could be two unrelated incidents, or as John says, that it might have been that, I that think, they, are, they are connected. I think that the 333 had its own accident. All right. And 444 came around and had a sympathy. No. No. Oh. 444 goes off. Yeah, so where, what happens to 333? We haven't seen it come into picture yet. Camera's tight on the 444. Yeah. Then the camera opens up, and there's 333. Oh, it's just had its accident. Finishing its accident, yeah. It had it, it, it spun. I think it had gone into the barrier on the left of the picture and the right of the racetrack and bounced back in the circuit. I think you're right, yes. That was a sympathy, possibly. Yeah. Or yeah. maybe there's something on the track we, you're not aware of. You can see the marks on the track where the car is rotated, hit the Tech Pro barriers and then bounced back out. Well, this is going to be a few minutes because you've got to sweep the circuit, clear the circuit, and is there any barrier damage down by well, the Treble 3 Ferrari. 444 four will be able to make its way back to the pits because there's no damage to that car. But the 333, uh, that's a different situation, and that yeah. car will be returned to the pits. Uh, well, what does remaining of the left side of it is certainly going to be returned to the pits. We've had a lot of people going off at the Lesmos today in GT3 cars, haven't we? We saw it More at Lesmo 1 than Lesmo 2, surprisingly. Yeah. Lesmo 2, for me, is the, the corner where it's more easy to make that error. Lesmo 1's never been a, a, a corner, in my opinion, that's been really the challenge of the two Lesmos. But if what we've seen today continues tomorrow, we might end up with quite a few full-course yellows or safety cars, was what was in my mind. Indeed. Or maybe the boys... Are, are there any girls in this weekend? Are we any? Uh, don't think we have. No. So anyway, everybody's going to have to consider it a three-hour race mm. and uh, contend with conditions that are provided. So there's the Rover Racing Porsche. Expecting great things from the Rover team with Porsche, their first venture with the Stuttgart manufacturer. So factory drivers and ball the 444 making its way, as I anticipated. But look, you can see the marks on the racetrack where the 333, I, I think it rode the curb and just all of a sudden, as I would know to my own cost, um, rotated and uh, 
I mean, it was an easy hit because you've got those tech pro barriers there. Yeah. Not, not like the good not old days. Old day, yeah. Not the good old days, but you slammed over to an armco and those armco mounting posts which took the gearbox off and the engine off. And there was your two-part McLaren. My two-part McLaren, which I didn't reckon realise until I got out of the car. And saw, oh, oh, that was mine. I wondered whose engine it was <laughs> sliding across the racetrack. <laughs> and then I saw that Michele Alboreto came round and collected him. He went off. Um, Hey ho, hey ho! <laughs> Walked away, never looked back. Well, I had to say sorry to the team. Yeah, true. Now the session's going to start again in 13 minutes' time, all being well. The sort of the corollary to that story was yes. that about four days later, I had to go to Donington Park to drive a McLaren MP4 because a former world champion was thinking about making a comeback and. That was the day that my good friend Nicky and wishing him all good health and recovery and all from the, the traumas that he's had to deal with. That was the day that he came and did his initial uh, suck it and see, if you don't care about that. And did he ask you about what had happened the weekend before at Monza? I don't think he had a clue. Really? It was, wasn't interesting. I don't remember. Watch. No, he, he was only going to be there to focus on what he was there right. to do. So it, it wasn't relevant in reality. And as it turned out, on that day, I did the quickest lap <laughs> for an MP4-1, whatever it was, 1A, yeah. 1B, uh, that had ever been um, established in any of the tests that we'd done at Donington. Wow. Track clearing, there's Florian Schultz's Ferrari. Florian, he's been racing for a long, long time now, and there is a rather sorrier-looking Ferrari. That's got quite a bit of damage, hasn't Yes, it? I mean, the left side has been heavily clobbered. And, I mean, the whole car will have to be stripped down. And it's not a lot of time because these cars will be back out on track at 9.30 Sunday morning. It is now quarter to six Saturday evening. So you've got the best part of 13 hours. That means an all-nighter for the Rinaldi race team. And while it, you can see the damage, it's what we don't see. You know, will there be any chassis damage, for example, or location for suspension components? Will the gearbox have taken a big hit? Does that have to be replaced? I mean, the list is endless. We've already had one car withdrawn, haven't we? From yeah, the 27, 27 Lazarus. Yeah, yeah the Lazarus um, Lamborghini went after yesterday, testing damage. 555, one of the cars from the Orange 1 FFF racing team. That's the Michele Beretta Taylor Proto Diego Menchaca car. Number nine, Carry Moje's BMW from Boots and Gignon. She shares with Philippe Stevenie and Mark Rostat. And Stevenie has shown this being the man behind the wheel. There he is. But of course, the teams have more frustration because the clock carried on ticking through all of this, so they've lost the track time. So the, the track is being swept. We've got tractors with blowers as well as. Brrr, no, is that. Now, what are, they going to, what are they going to use that for? The yellow, it's got a, are they going to have to remove a part of the barrier or not? There is the Ferrari on its way back. Might be that you pull the barrier back in line, you sort of pull it forward. May have to get in there and uh, give it a bit of muscle. Yeah. So a sad sight to see that Ferrari being taken back to the pits in the back of the flatbed. There, looking at spectacular colour schemes, is the SMP Racing Ferrari. Davide Rigon mm -hmm. stands by the car. Making sure the Ferrari badge is clean. Miguel Molina standing with it. Strong car, strong lineup. Yeah. Very unlucky last year. Been unlucky. I mean, I don't know how many times we've seen that car in the leading group uh, and then not quite make it to the, the top of the podium. 111 is the Antonelli Motorsport Mercedes of Davide Roda, Giuseppe Cipriani, and Marco Antonelli. Number 17 there is from WRT, the uh, car of. Shea Davis, Paul Petit, and Alex McDowell. So 57 minutes and counting effectively now. In fact, Shea Davis had just set the fastest speed in sector one, 240. Well, that's not right. They've got a purple speed, yet other cars have done it in excess of 248 kilometers. Oh, well, maybe a little timing and scoring, or in terms of top speeds. Not quite accurate. Fourteenth position for the 17 ID. 
Estimated restart, four minutes time, so we're not far off. So we're going to have the best part of just over 50 minutes by the time yeah. they do their outlap to uh, conclude getting all the drivers cycled through and to make the crunch judgment. If it was me, I would do it. I would run another set of tyres mm. because if it's wet in the morning, you've really lost little. The argument is you want to have the best possible sets of tyres for what might be a dry race, but again, nobody can be sure that it will be a dry race, or it might be part damp, part wet, part dry, whatever. Drivers staying in the cars. In some cases, there's been a driver change, but everyone getting ready to go out because they need to be on their toes. Jazz Motorsport, mm. they are the company based in Italy, responsible for putting these Honda NSX together. This particular car run by Bob Neville and, uh, well, in the colours we mentioned previously, of the patron of the team. Indeed. We just had a race win, in fact, from a Honda NSX GT3 yeah. Evo with Jens Muller winning in the Brock Pan Sports Club. First ever win for that uh, type of car. Dries Van Thor is the fastest at the moment still, and he is with Dakota in the pits. Dries, you are currently running in P1. This is good on your back of success from last year at this race. Must bring back good memories. And you must have the key to success here of getting a very quick lap. Tell me, where does that time come from? Um, well, the Audi is quick, so no. I mean, it's always nice to come back to Monza. I like the track a lot. Uh, and, you know, last year went well here, so we're going to try to repeat it this year as well. But, um, yeah, I mean, the car is performing well at the moment. Um, where the time is coming from, I don't know. I think the car is just quick, so we'll see. The forecast is looking very interesting tomorrow. Are you going to be as quick in the wet as you are on the dry? Well, I actually do hope that it's going to be wet because I think we have more chance in the wet than in the dry. Um, just to be honest, uh, I think in the dry will be more, it will be harder for us. But you know, they say it's going to rain tomorrow, so let's hope it's going to rain, and then you know maybe we can see where we can end up higher or not. Well, you may hope so because you got cover under your head. Good luck, anyway. Well done. Could be a bad hair day. <laughs> Well, Dries Van Thor has done his work for the moment and looks forward to tomorrow. I mean, he's right in saying that he, he, there might be better in the wet because last year the Audis, I remember you saying it as, as the race went on, they're not at the races and it was only late race that with some good pit stop strategy and right, how many, out of sequence, they got up there at the end. Right, how many laps did they run behind trying, trying into, into the first chicane to make that pass down the inside? No, he's got his bicycle helmet on now. But it was only in, yes, indeed, it's only in the third stint that the car really joined in uh, and became competitive. So, yes, Dries Van Thor with his cycling helmet on. The track is clear and we're good to go. Restart at 17.53, so we're a minute and change away from getting underway now. So there is one of the access points uh, at the, down at the, the two Lesmo, Lesmo 1, Lesmo 2. And wouldn't it be nice? I think it would be nice anyway if we could see a return to the corner profile of what used to be Lesmo 2. Mm. Used to be a really, really high speed corner. Very challenging. This corner, Lesmo 2 now, was slowed down fundamentally because of the Grand Prix and the fear that corner speed in a high downforce single seater was gonna get just out of control. But I think the levels of downforce that these cars are generating it's not a million miles away from what a Formula One car would have been maybe 30 years ago. Yeah, possibly so. Well, we are going to have 52 minutes, give or take, when we get going again. See the clock ticking on down. New sets of tyres going on, the Audis. So they've been listening to you, John. You see Vincent Voss has had a new pack of highlights of players this year. So there's the uh, green and the yellow and the red adorning the Audis. The green one's already gone to the end of the pit lane to try to be first out. Then number 74, that's the uh, car from Ram Racing of Ramon Voss and Tom Onslow Cole. I'll tell you fifth. what, it is a mega uh, bit of, well, that's a, a, probably a wrap also. Yeah. But the the choice of the, the paint on it, or the, the wrap on it, is uh, very interesting. It doesn't show up in a long camera shot, but in the pit lane, certainly very exciting. Right, we're green again, we're in business, and out they all pour. Lots of people looking for, if they can, a better lap time. Others still trying to cycle through a programme, but 
everybody comes onto the road. The carbons, well, actually, we've got a handful that haven't even done a time yet, strangely, despite the fact we've had over half an hour. Marco Bortolotti hasn't done a time. Marco Mappelli hasn't. So that's uh, two of the separate Lamborghini teams. Stracker's car, which was damaged early this morning, that hasn't yet done a lap. And Nora's Jim Plaz, Acker, Mercedes. Well, Maxime Soule, 36th in the Bentley, Chris Buncombe in the Ferrari, 37th. They've done four and six laps respectively, but not laps of any consequence. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. So I would imagine that they're just going to hang around and wait and do what they need to do, but not do any more. In other words, keep the tyre they've got until they deem track conditions, maybe in the last 15 minutes, if they want to just stay with one particular set of tyres and see what they can do on that. So out they all pour. So number two now, Alex Riveras is at the wheel of it. 26, that was Marcus Winterhock, has gone to Fabian Michel. Number 90, Mercedes, has gone to Nico Bastian. Remel Voss takes over number 74 from Tom Onslow Cole. Seb Morris got back into number 31, Bentley. So, quite a bit of shuffling in some of the cars. And way out wide there goes the 17 Audi. That's Shea Davis at the wheel. Exploring, because he's not been to Monza before, exploring all of it, makes the old banking almost. This morning, David, we saw that unusual accident for Jack Hawksworth. Yes. And uh, did we, we never got a, uh, an explanation as to why he went off? The car appears to have gone out at some point, uh, like four laps at short yeah. the time of the scoring, but it looked like it's four in and out laps. Just insulation laps, yes. presumably to make sure all is well, yeah. systems check type yeah. laps, yeah. Uh, no, it's Jack Hawksworth who went off very, very early on, brought the first red flag out at Valiant Ascari. Uh, no, you're quite right, we never got to the bottom of that, sadly, not yet, but the car has been put back together, and Dev Gore, the American driver, is behind the wheel of it, but as yet, no proper lap time done. And he's, I think, gone out onto the circuit now. Again. Again. Mirko Bortolotti, yet to do a lap time. There's the car, number 63. Christian Engelhart back in the fold for that, and Rolf Nachen as well. Strong driver lineup. I think they're just pacing themselves. Okay, we're now getting the belts attached, uh, the hands and neck device, very important. And who's it? Christian Engelhardt in the car, or is it Bortolotti? The timing screen is saying Bortolotti, but. Oh, well, we're at orange one anyway, aren't we, at the moment? Yeah. 63 is a grasso for entry. But uh, Marco Bortolotti should be out in that. Marco Mappelli for the Orange One team. There is Philippe Stevani in the Boots and Chignon BMW. Carrie Mojo, last year's sports club champion. And back into the Endurance Cup as the BMW. Is that the only BMW we've got this year? It is. Yeah. It's interesting to see whether Valkenhorst comes back as the winners of Spa well, 24 indeed. last year. Uh, they would need to be doing something before they would end up at Spa. Yeah. Undoubtedly, six hours of Paul Ricard would be a, the perfect test, or three hours around Silverstone. Indeed. Maybe both. Ideally. I'm just wondering, is there a VLN race this weekend? Is it the qualification race this weekend? That's why one or two of the teams aren't here. Anyway, Marco Mappelli goes back out for the uh, Orange 1 FFF Racing team, and the track gets busier and busier and busier once again. So now you have the problem of finding a clear gap in the traffic. Dev Gore, the Stracker, has just done his first flying lap. He's gone up to 34. So the American driver doing a good job there. And the one by one Mercedes is in the hands of David Roda. Experienced driver, former touring car racer, a Lamborghini racer, you name it. He's one of those ubiquitous people that find something to drive almost anywhere for someone most weekends. Well, if you're a professional racing driver and you're not driving every weekend, you're doing something wrong. Yeah, exactly. Marvin Kirkhofer for the Aston Martin R Motorsport team has just gone sixth fastest, 148.896. Look at this traffic jam here. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's no point in running around in traffic at this point. All you want to do 
get as clear a bit of racetrack in that you've got to drop back and you might waste maybe two or three minutes in finding that slot but you'll learn more once you find the slot than running behind a series of cars because all you're going to do is pick up understeer temperatures brake temperatures water oil temperature is going to go up as well there is the 76 here chopper so personal best first and second so potential for the 76 Aston Martin to step up from provisional sixth quickest comes across start finish line now yes up to fourth great effort that so two laps bringing it into the mix and also Bentley 108 and Maxime Soule is up to 12 fastest on this restart, there's a bit more urgency about the session, possibly because there's not that much time left anymore, but suddenly you're seeing a lot more green, a lot more improvements in sectors and in lap times. Well, we're halfway through the session. They've had a, they've had a stoppage in it for about eight minutes, but all of a sudden the realisation is the second 45 minutes always appears to go more quickly than the first 45 minutes. Dev Gorf and Strack are improving again as well, up to 30th. There is Kirkhofer, who's now stuck in the traffic. Sule, I'd give you Chris Buncombe, 13th fastest. Oh, no. The Rover Porsche oh in the tyres. That's going to be a round, surely. That's going to be a stoppage. Well, oh, he's trying to get it back. He's got reverse gear. He's yeah. trying to reverse the line, but... Red flag. It's, yeah, it is. That's the, what, the smart thing to do. Just stop the session, get the car removed. It was only going to bury itself even more. Again, at Lesmo 2. A long way off. A way, way off. All of a sudden, Lesmo 2 is the corner of choice for all these stoppages. Absolutely. Maybe, maybe we'll have a view of what was the cause, but it, it went nose front in. Mm. So again, strange. We'll also try and piece it together if we can. Also, which of the two Rover Porsches was that? They've both gone out. They're both on track at yeah. the time. Matthew Germinet was in one, and Matt Campbell was in the other. Campbell in 99. Gemini 98. Matt Campbell's car, apparently. So Matt Campbell. Matt Campbell behind the wheel. Uh, gone off. And remember, he had a little off this morning coming up through the Escaro chicane, ran a little bit wide into the chicane, then had to cut across the gravel on the inside. So let's look and see. Where is the Porsche? Sure, there's the Nissan. No. He's off. He's off. He's gone. Very strange. Just didn't seem to turn, did it? Well, Either he turned and got a massive amount of oversteer and he had to straighten it up, and then once he's on the gravel, he's just a passenger. Well, now we're going to end up with barrier repairs to eat into the time allowed, aren't we? Uh, I've just noticed a couple of the circuit vehicles going out to help you know, the tractors and the, the low loaders with the tyres on to go rebuild the tyre wall. So, well, that's a requirement. I mean, you've got yeah. to put the circuit back to the condition it was in at the start of the session. So those drivers that were all, I mean, Mentioned Chris Buncombe up to 13th, just beginning to build to a time that would equate more to what they might look to do at qualifying. If it is wet tomorrow to the point where the cars don't run, which is what some teams are fearing, if it's horrendously wet, not only are you going to end up with the grid based on this session, but the session in itself has been so bitty that lots of teams have never got a, a proper run in. And there, you go out, we just said about the urgency of the second half of it, we talked about times changing and improvements, bang, another red flag. Uh, we could be at another 10 minutes here before they go out. Yeah, possibly could be. I mean, certainly it's going to be 35 minutes to go at the earliest. That would be just over seven minutes to get the car removed. Whether there's damage to that left front, couldn't really tell. Whether it's capable of being driven back on its own, it needs a flatbed to lift it up and return it to the pit. Don't know that either. Then the repair that might be required, that could take five minutes, could take a little bit longer. Depends what the damage to the the bales, the tyre bales is, or whether there's further damage behind. So down the pit road. Oh, there is it. There's the Porsche, yeah. It's going to, looks like it's going to get driven back because the car is just being lifted up and it'll be dropped down once it gets to the edge of the racetrack. So there wouldn't appear to be anything that's critical to the left front of the Porsche. So drop it down gently, boys. There we are, good job. And then just release those straps, pull them through, and uh, Matt Campbell will be on his way. Then the remaining is to see what there is. There we are, fire her up. Hold on, here's, a, here's the wrecker coming to pick you up to take you home. And the five Audi, which is the 
car with Ivan Pereiras behind the wheel, shared with Kim Lewis Graham and Finley Hatchison. Well, this is a good time to put your car back into the pits. Is that what they're going to do? Or are they just getting it lined up in echelon to just make a little bit more working space? Oh, he goes, I mean, it's how it got there, we didn't see because I imagine on the approach into the Lesmo 2, turned, oversteer, straightened up, and then just effectively was on the dirty part of the exit of the corner and then just dragged up. Not a lot of damage to the tyre bale, just needs to be reconstructed. There's the 26 whereabouts, are they currently their second quickest still? So it's Audi one and two at the minute. Mercedes three, Nico Bastian. That's the sister Porsche. If Matt Campbell's reported anything wrong with his car that caused it, they might want to have a quick look at the other one because suddenly it goes into the pit box rather than being on the apron. And they're having a look at something. Well, I think they're going to just change wheels and tyres, that's all. They're doing okay. it in the garage because yeah. they can do it in the garage. True. That looked to me to be uh, what I'd call an oversteer moment for Matt Campbell. And in the course of, course of correcting it, you put left hand locked down because you want to turn right. The car then snaps straight, by which time you've got onto the dirty part of the exit of the corner and you've got no grip and you just end up going straight across the gravel. I think that Campbell hoped he might stop before he got to the tyre bales. Uh, but of course, you're carrying at that point maybe 80, 90 miles an hour at the point when you'd have been going off and you're still going to hit the bales probably about 30 miles an hour. So just sit there as a passenger waiting for the inevitable. There's Fabian Michel in the Santalot Audi. Still haven't had a lap time out of Mirko Bortolotti, nor Marco Mappelli, nor Jim Plough. They've had a series of installation laps, systems checks laps, but no more than that. And they're just sitting waiting it out. Mm. I mean, they're going to go out, maybe 15 minutes to go. Um, I mean, there's, we think it's Bortolotti sitting inside the 63 Lamborghini. So everybody will be getting a little bit more nervous and tense because the clock's still ticking away. How long it's going to take to rectify the tyre bales up at uh, Lesmo 2 shouldn't take too long. Now, Marvin Kirchhoff was doing a good job improving his lap times. He's out of the car, he's with Dakota. Marvin, now you're currently running in fourth place. You're almost just above three tenths from Dries's, um time. Was that on full tank of fuel, new tyres? What setup was that on? Old tyres, full fuel, race run. You would say that, wouldn't you? Well, no, I mean, we, obviously everyone is trying a bit, but uh, we gave it a try, see how it goes. But, uh, well, there's still something to find. We're not really happy yet with the setup, but we're doing good improvements. And how is it dealing with the new car? Oh, it's a nice car. I like it. Like, already in Abu Dhabi, I saw, like, I feel comfortable with it. Uh, really good lineup this year with Jake and with Nikki for the first round. So, yeah, I think we can do something good. Maybe this is not really our track. We didn't expect it to be quick over here, but let's see. What's your favorite part of the track? Um, well, the chicane, the first one is quite nice, especially for racing. You can dive in and just maybe do some overtakes. But generally, yeah, it's a good fun racetrack. We'll see what happens in race with you in turn one. Thank you very much. Yes, we don't yet know who the start drivers are, but if Marvin Kirkhofer is the start driver, then he will be in that battle at turn one. So the clock ticking on down, teams working away still, in some cases, with these newer cars, new cars, but working on setup. John, we were talking this morning about this new Aston Martin and fundamentally the new engine. Yes, I mean, it, it's been a commercial judgment that um, the cost of designing a brand new engine from scratch in a boutique manufacturer that, with the volume that Aston Martin has is virtually prohibitive. They, they are working on new engine product, but in the short term, for all the, 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 the reasons that the world is widely global warming, to short couple of question. There's the damage to the front of the Porsche, by the way, so it's just a bit of a rub, nothing serious. So the short term uh, solution was to go to AMG and arrange a commercial uh, deal to supply the same engine that's in the Mercedes AMG GT3s. Fantastic engine, I mean, efficient, powerful, drivable, and that's the engine that's in the Aston Martin chassis. Now, traditionally, Aston Martin have always had a really, really good chassis, but that was with the very long and the quite tall V12, but it was very narrow, so it helped 
probably with some of the aerodynamics underneath the car and you know a for straightforward uh, naturally aspirated engine now we've got one or two of the cars queuing at the end of the pit lane we are meant to be going live at 1812 it's 1808 now there is the Fabian Martez Lexus Fabian at the wheel of it the former Manchester United goalkeeper World Cup winner for France and before we go live let's hear from more of the Porsche squad Dirk Werner is with Dakota Dirk, that was a pretty nasty off there. Do you know what happened? I know Matt was driving the car. Yeah, in the end, I just can tell you what everybody saw on the television, that the car in the Lesmo 2 corner uh, went straight already on the entry of the corner. So uh, I have to talk to Matt. I, I, I cannot tell you. Um, the car is a bit damaged. I hope we can get it ready for the rest of the session so we can check if everything is all right. Is the damage severe or is it going to be still working? This you have to ask the mechanics, but uh, from outside it looks like they might change some parts. Uh, normally on, on this Porsche you can change the front uh, quite quickly, so uh, I think they managed to, to get us out in the end. And any other concerns apart from what just happened? No, I mean, the guys will check the car. If they think the car is all right, they will send us out, it will be all right. So this definitely wasn't expected? Yeah. Good luck. One of the vulnerabilities that on the Porsche is that the radiators, those twin water radiators mounted in the corners of the left hand, right hand side of the nose, and they are prone if you do have a front end collision to damage the radiator, yeah, split yeah. the water hose, and that then is a different thing. There didn't appear to be any water coming from the front of the, the Porsches that made its way back to the pits. So it probably looks more just to be superficial. And even the bodywork, I think, was probably good enough to still run. But they may want to change it uh, just in the interests of, of consistency, continuity and safety. Have Broom, have Rake will travel. That Campbell coming into Lesmo 2 was quite close to the next car directly ahead of him. Now, that might have caused him to check up rather suddenly because maybe that car checked up suddenly as well. So we just got a glimpse of it coming out of one into Lesmo 2. So plan to second guess what uh, Matt Campbell might eventually hopefully get to tell uh, our pit lane reporter Dakota. Chris Buncombe shown as still being in 93. There he is. Jonathan Hui and uh, Chris Froggart, the other two drivers. Chris Froggart, who's come out of the uh, European Ferrari Challenge. He's raced here in Ferrari successfully, but he and Chris were Britain at the Nations Cup last year. And that's uh, started this good relationship. Track looks to be fit to have cars recommence. The, what, 33 and a half minutes of this session was 90 minutes at the start. They've had, now was it two or three lizard green the dynamic motorsports. Yes, yeah, first thing we've seen of the car yeah. all weekend. Zayn Ashkanani out of the Super Cup and Carrera Cup with Klaus Backler, former Porsche Junior, and Andrea Rizzoli, regular Ferrari racer at the wheel of that Italian team. Uh, right, we're going to go green in 10 seconds, everybody. As the uh, Honda there sits ready to go. And at the end of the pit lane, look at this million euro traffic jam, this queue of cars being released now. So got two Mercedes out first. And then number 15, I think, should be next, but he doesn't want to go. The, the Lambo. Yeah, come on, goes now. Everyone else bottled up behind it. You know, it, you think that you're going to lose minutes sitting behind the cars coming to the pit lane. It's a bit like me getting into Westgate Car Park <laughs> in Oxford. Take your ticket, hurry up through the barrier. Oh, you know, when you get the old sort of rubbernecks coming in. Uh, uh. Where do I go? Oh, spare me, I tell you. <laughs> I'm over, I mean, the old heart beats up around about 5,000 per minute. WRT finishing off the pit stops, so taking their time about that. New tyres going on, but that for Alex Riveras. Interesting, Alex is getting a new set of tyres. Yeah, I just don't to say that, but he's bearing in mind that we, time. we think that Reese Van Paul is probably the driver of the team that might make better use, but well, the team know what they're doing, they've been in this business long enough. Equally, you've still got to get your three drivers through the pre-qualifying session, so they have to have had some mileage in pre-qualifying. Now, temperature is dropping. If they feel that this is a good opportunity to now go for a time, they, they may run that corner to putting the new tyres on. Let's see what he can do. Well, temperature is dropping, which ultimately means it's going to take slightly longer to get your tyre temperature up to operating temperature. 
Secondly, air gets it more dense. That means you're going to have a little bit more, a fraction more you know, horsepower from the motor. And the other factor is denser air gives you, again, fractional gains in aerodynamics. But the key will be getting the tyre to get into that temperature at the right point, but you go on to your first flying lap to get the maximum performance from the set of Pirellis. Fabian Bartes and Benjamin Goethe, plus their team managers, being summoned to the stewards straight after the session. 108, Maxim Sule there, jinking around to get the wall back into the rubber. And Mirko Bortolotti, still haven't done a time, Mirko, have you? Why not? What's going on? What's the master plan? Master plan is wait, wait. And when we think or deem it the right time, we've got just over 30 minutes, then we'll see the Italian go out, and I suspect that when the space of his second flying lap, we'll have a very, well, a very, Mirko Bortolotti there, the man that doesn't blink, will blinking a bit at the minute when his concentration levels, of course, are at normal. But when you're in that deep mode of concentration, barely see a flicker on his eyelids. So just car up on the jacks, no wheels and tyres on. Yeah, comfortable place to be, warm. It's getting a nip in the air now yeah. as we're coming up to quarter past six in the evening here at Monza. Maxime Soule in the 108. The robs its way out of the second chicane down into Lesbo 1. Dips the nose as he gets on the brakes. And he's coming up behind the number 15, 15. Lamborghini, the Boots and Junior car, which is Pierre Fellagioni. Up, another one up from the sports club, in fact, yeah. Well, he'll not want to be behind the Lamborghini for too long. And he will lose all the good work that he's generated for the first two-thirds of the circuit by getting trapped behind the 15 Lamborghini up into Ascari. And that's precisely what has happened. You can see that the Lamborghini way, way slower through the chicane than Sule and the Bentley. That takes the speed away from the Bentley that, therefore, on the exit, not able to maybe carry the additional performance that the Bentley had when he's managed to get up alongside, which is all that he needed to do. Marco Mapelli, purple, oh, in oh, oh. sector one. On his first flying lap. Ah, I wonder why. Let me think. There's a well, reason for that. Not anymore, he's not. Seb Morris has just done a purple, and now Philip Frommenweiler has done a purple in the first sector. So the tyres are set to tumble here. New tyres. New tyres and new tyres and new tyres. So the timing screen lights up. And in fact, number two is now being shown, not as Alex Riveras, but is the Ingrid Perez compact. Oh. Let's see what Ezekiel can do on a set of fresh rubber on that number two. Oh dear. Right, Bortolotti has not yet left the pit lane. It's going to be a one Banzai lap, this by the look of it. Marco Mapelli is out on a quick one. So is Philip Frommenweiler in the Honda. Absolute best and personal best. Whoops, way, way wide there goes. Is that the Parker Bentley? It was, Seb Morris. Getting a bit giddy. That is, for the 27 Honda, sorry, 22 Honda, that is, I would say, awesome. Yeah. They uh, were very happy indeed with the long runs this morning. They felt they were right in the ballpark in terms of lap time at race pace. And there's Morris after a little moment. So Morris goes through. Marco Mapelli goes quickest, 147.926. There, Marco Mapelli on his first flying lap goes to the top of the times, the Honda has just gone through, fifth quickest, Philip Frommenweiler, a 148.235, three tenths off top time. Suddenly and finally, this session is beginning to light up. Yeah, definitely, but Marco, sorry, Mirko Bortolotti, still in the pits. Good and Jim Clark hasn't done a time either. Yeah, 80, well, 87, uh, ASP. Suddenly it's jumped up, up to fourth. So it's gone from zero to fourth in the space of, again, one lap. Yeah. All right, there's triple five, good to go, which is now Taylor Proto, the American. He's raced in Europe, but only in the Lambo World Finals. Raffaele Marchiello now goes quickest. We're into the 47s, 147.885. Marchiello Mapelli, then the Dries Van Vanthor time of earlier on, Jim Pla, a Winkelhock time fifth, and Nico Bastiani sixth from Avila seventh. Now, that time that we've seen, well, we haven't seen it, but it's not timing and scoring is now within what a tenth and a bit of the best that we saw this morning from 
That was Marcus Winkelhock. There is the car now gone quickest of all. And I wonder, is there still enough you know, gas in the tank, I mean, by that grip within the Pirelli tyres, to enable them, with a clear run on his second flying lap on this set of fresh rubber, to go even quicker. In these cooler conditions, there may well just be enough. What have we got? 26 minutes on the clock, Marcello Mappelli, the order. We've now got more shuffling because Jake Dennis improves his lap time. Fifth behind Jim Clark, 148-108. I'm waiting for Waterlotti to leave the pit lane, but I've not yet seen a green streak go out in front of us. Florian Schultzer, after his moment, remains 35th, and Dennis Bulatov 29th. There goes Waterlotti. Hold on to your hat, because now former champion is let loose. We understand they were waiting purely for a gap in the traffic on the right stage in the, in the session. 25 right, minutes I tell you to what, go. It's a, a very long time, 65 minutes, waiting for a window. Now, clearly, they think this is going to count for the grid. Oh, listen, I think, I mean, well, what can I say? In the booth, we've been saying that off mic all day. And this is the, the one effort. Let's put the best tyres we can on it, wait for the optimum moment, bam, send him out. Mirko Bortolotti, then. The time to beat is a 1.47.645. It's Marciello who's done that time, 47.6. That's an improvement it on is. his previous, who he's picked up the best part of two tenths of a second quickest lap so far this weekend. So can Portolotti attack that time? He's on track. It'll be a gentle start-up lap. That's the biggest car, that's much yellow, who shares this year with Vincent Abrella and Michael Meadows. That's a really good combination oh, of drivers. Know, there's it? no question about it. I mean, Vincent Abrella stepping over from Bentley into the Mercedes Aka ASP team. He has grown a lot in the last three years, ready for the opportunities that this car is going to provide him with. And right now, just watching the body language of Raffaele Marcello in that Mercedes on the edge, but it is a beautifully controlled edge. So through goes Marcello then. His best lap, a 47.6. He's slightly down in the middle sector, but he was slightly up in the first, but gained 62 thousandths and lost two tenths. So He's lost ground. Philip Frommenweiler's Honda is up to fourth quickest. Frommenweiler being a revelation in this. We've seen him in Carrera Cup in the past, but he's shining currently. Also, Christopher Husser's Audi's up to 14th. Who else has improved? Gabriele Piana, 15th fastest. And Bortolotti's sectors are not yet stunning, but the next one should be. Yes, and more interesting that we've seen Marcello now on a good lap, but he realised that middle sector was fractionally done. So rather than wasting the tyre any longer, back into the pit lane and stop. There's Bortolotti then, and he's about to go for it, isn't he? As he comes then now up towards the timing line, goes through. Clearish racetrack. Yeah. He's yeah. going to have a clear lap on his first flying lap. There's the car directly ahead of one of the, I think the Porsche. So that's not going to come into play for the 63 Lamborghini. And let's stay with this if we can down towards the first chicane. John will talk you around the lap. I'll keep an eye to the splits and see how he's doing. Very neat and tidy, as is always the best way through the first chicane. Then hard on it, that fresh set of rubber. So Mirko Bortolotti, well, he knows what he's got. He's won here in this car in the Lamborghini Huracan. He's been all over it in every the last three seasons. 2018 car was a oh, big lock up and he's going to overshoot the corner. And it's all gone wrong for the Italian, on top of which he's probably flat spotted that left front, right front tyre. And all of a sudden, what has gone wrong? It's gone wrong in the cockpit. He made a mistake, locked up that right front. And once he had done that, he couldn't check the speed of the car. He had no option but to take the escape route. And now I would say he's got to go back into the pits and red faced apologize to the team. So Bortolotti, after all that great build-up, drops the ball, and he's got 22 minutes in which to get perhaps a new set of tyres on. Well, it's, it's going to change the plan that the Grasso Racing team might have had. All of a sudden, that right front, in my view, will be significantly out of balance and would not be able to be used again, so they're going to have to maybe dig deep and bite a bullet and put on another set of tyres and tell Merkel to maybe fractionally earlier get on the brakes. Christopher Hasser up to third, and the 
Lamborghini of Diego Menchaca is an improver up to 18th fastest now. So there's only Bortolotti that hasn't done a lap time. Wouldn't it be a real quirk of the grid if he ended up at the back of it for tomorrow? Well, it might be wet, so we may still have run. It may not be wet, 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 but might be just wet, wet. There is Christopher Hasser, I just mentioned he's gone third. There he is. Um, the sounds like Audi is behind. So is Bortolotti staying out? I don't believe he can. I think that the vibration from that flat spot of right tyre will be so severe that uh, he will be having but quadruple vision yeah. at any speed above about 40 kilometers per hour. Frank Pereira doing a good job in sixth place, although he's been disposed. Christopher Hasser has done that, that leapfrog. Frank Pereira in one of the uh, Orange One FFF racing team. That weird. Frank Pereira could be a used car, uh, a quality used car salesman. He's driven every brand that I know exists in, in Blancpain, Endurance and Sprint. I think you're right. There he is, third fastest over the line goes Menchaca, XF4 racer, single seater racer. And Phoenix Audi rejoining there in the background, and Bortolotti is in the pits. Now, I, I, I can't believe he's saying that set of front tyres is going to be okay. anything it's almost well, as though he's concerned that there's a problem which is yes. the car locked up well he's they're, they're rotating the wheels as if it's in gear to see whether the diff is working or not or if it's working correctly uh, that's not something would be part of the normal work and routine in a session like this as we look at the 98 Porsche and you see the dip in the nose I mean, these cars are doing 265 or so kilometers per hour just over 160 miles an hour coming down into the parabolica and then Make that early apex and then let the car flow, float almost out to the outside of the corner. The 23rd, which is not really what you'd hope for. Now, Vincent Abril has just taken over 88. Marco Mappelli will go back out again in a moment. Who else have we got looking quick? Either in terms of that time or so. The, the damage Mercedes, yeah, from earlier on is 11th. Lewis Williamson, the Stracker Mercedes, 11th quickest. Yeah, that's a very good effort because the team had to work a long time for the car. We never saw the cause, it just appeared to shoot straight across the entrance into Ascari and ended up in the tar bales. And um, so the team was done extremely well, A, to get the car rebuilt, but secondly, to get the car to run so competitively that they could get it up into that position. How did any mileage this morning whatsoever? Yeah, 11th quickest currently. Yeah. Mathieu Jemenet's Porsche up to 23rd. Portolotti still in the pits. 18 minutes to go. It's not looking quite so um, secure now, is it? Not quite so clever. No. Yeah, that, I mean, look, you, you ha everybody has to make their plan, everybody has to stick to the plan. But what wasn't in the plan was that issue coming into the second chicane. Massive lock up, particularly in the right front. Whether it was something that was mechanical that Bartolotti couldn't control, or whether it was simply he just outbraked himself, maybe the front tyre wasn't quite up to the level, the grip level, that the brakes had the capacity to uh, apply. More fuel put into the WRT Audi. Oh, Michael Meadows has now shown something taken over 88, so Raffaele. Vincent Abril have uh, had a go. Now Michael Meadows, who we've not seen much of today, is behind the wheel. Car number 29 is reporting to the stewards for speeding in the pit lane. That's the Stefano Costatini, Antonio Forne and Christoph Lent, that Lamborghini. And Bortolotti is still in, and now with a man underneath the car. Well, they're looking around the rear of the car. No? You've got drive shafts, you've got suspension components. Of course, you've got the differential. I can't imagine that it's anything to do with the differential, but that's for sure. The focus of attention is at the rear of the car with the rear wheels off. Maxim Sule, personal best sector one, currently in 20th position. They would like to see an improvement because they need to have a, a clearer guide as to the dry potential time that these two M Sport Bentleys got the opportunity to just relying on a really good race pace is important but qualifying position 
in the position that these penalties would normally expect to be is also equally important. So this could be a race battle, couldn't it? Sule on the back of the SMP Racing Ferrari. Now, where is that car in the times? The red, white and blue Ferrari is only 29th of Davide Rigon. That's a long way down. And look at the way the Venti just eats up the gap, devours the Ferrari on the run towards the chicane, but can't get the job. Yes, he can get the job done just in time. Yeah, the Ferrari steered away and allowed uh, Maxime Sule to do so. There is the 98 Porsche. So that was uh, you know, a question of just being sensible, not having an argument. But the bet had put itself into that area of no man's land where will I won't die and the guy then came from the Ferrari and go ahead I'm going to give concede ground 15 minutes and a bit remaining of this 90 minute session started approximately a quarter past five in the evening is going to end at approximately a quarter to seven ambient temperature continuing to drop but that's all that's dropping. There's nothing in the form of rain indicating it might be falling. So all this scare about rain coming overnight being of biblical proportions, maybe as the weather is constantly being updated, may not be a factor. Indeed so. Weather forecasts are noted for not always being strictly right. Um, teams have to factor all that in. Now, Johnny Adam is improving. Uh, there he is up to 28th now in the Garage 59 Aston Martin. And Bortolotti still in the pits, but is he about to depart? Well, they're just locking up the wheels. I don't know. They, no, we didn't see if they put on a second set of tyres on this car, or is this the set that he originally went out? No, they've got a just using the torque wrench to make sure that those wheel nuts are torqued to the required requisite torque setting. So Portalotti goes out for a second go. We don't know, because we didn't see if that was a second set of tyres either used or new, or the original set. My opinion is that... Oh, trouble, trouble, trouble! Oh, that was too close for comfort. Yeah, so was that getting it all wrong? Number five Audi it is. Kim Louis Schramm, yes, yes yeah. down in 21st. He just improved his lap time, in fact, getting a bit giddy on his next lap. Bortolotti is back on track. So, what can he do? He's got a 47.6 to beat in 13 minutes. He could look really silly at the end of this. He could look like a real hero. There's not much middle ground. There's nothing at all. I mean, they sat out, understandably, and I think it was a very good policy to sit there and wait, let everybody else pound around. Hopefully the track would be getting better by the lap. Well, certainly the ambient dropping and the benefits of denser air would work in your favour, but of course it's a rule of the dice that if something happens, maybe you get bogged down in traffic, but they put Porto out in clear air. The team did their bit. It was coming into that second chicane. We don't know the reason why Bortolotti had that major lock-up, whether it was a mechanical issue, whether it was a driver issue, whether it was something that well, we need to speak to Bortolotti at some point and ask him what happened. Well, he might be being spoken to as the fastest driver can be in. Let's wait and see. Johnny Adam goes by and stays 28 behind Chris Froggart. Much less experienced a driver. Honda also comes yeah. out. Currently... Sixth now. Yeah. Thanks. Matt yeah. McMurray, yes. the American, Young American driver. Not seeing much of him today. So Bortolotti's next lap's the one to look for. There's number 19 in. So the Brasser squad hard at work with that car. Are they looking to change pads? Yes, they are. Yeah. Or maybe I know they're doing. They're putting in a new set of pads, and those will be, I assume, to be bedded in. I'm assuming for Sunday. Oh, I'm at the wheel. Sorry. Yeah. Again, as part of the. You might call it housekeeping, a team yeah. goes through. You've got three major, major high-speed brakes in this circuit. So you want to have the best possible pad thickness. And a set of spares. Yeah. Mercedes looks great coming out of Lesmo 1, doesn't it? 
It does. This is the Black Falcon car, one of the cars that I think has got to be a serious, serious threat. I agree with that. And it's such an understated car, that. I mean, there's, there's hardly any livery to it at all. It's just a blue oh. Mercedes, and it goes well. It just looks like it's been delivered by your nearest Mercedes-Benz yeah. dealer into the paddock, and uh, it's so understated looking. Behind the wheel of it currently is Mauro Engel. It just improved to go 12th. It's not the quickest Mercedes, in fact, but it's a quick car, and come the race, let's see. So we've got 11 minutes to go. Walter Lotti on track. Mauro Engel coming down to the Parabolica. This lap has had two personal bests. So there's another improvement beckoning. He's only got a corner to go and then straighten the car up. Whoops, goes a little bit wide, but keeps all four wheels. Yeah, so he, 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 white lines. That's OK. That's fine. That's and fine. the time he did was a 48-2. The time he does is... There we go. A 48-070, and that puts him seventh. That is what four tenths away from the time that Raffaele Marcello set, what some 15 or more minutes ago, yeah. in the 88 back at ASB. So, our angle. I mean, that that car. I remember back at Nurburgring was just the class of the field of the of the of the Mercedes entrance. Right, Bortolotti's gone up to 45th, and we have a car missing, don't we? Not done a time, not been out. There are 47 shown on the screen. 48 in the entry, even allowing the number 27 Lazarus car that withdrew. What am I missing? Roberto Bortolotti going through. This is the corner of that quarter march some 10 minutes ago. No lock up this time. Gets the car slowed down. Through cleanly. It runs a little bit of the curb on the exit, but. Well, an issue into Lesma 1, off the brakes, turn the wheel, get the throttle on, balance the steering and the throttle to allow the car to straighten up on the exit, to try and make the exit as straight as possible. Good entry into Lesma 2, then runs wide, just clips the curb on the exit, carries good speed now. Down this third straight, although it's actually a dog leg, up into the Ascari chicane. So really, actually, there's four parts of the circuit where you've got Pretty significant high-speed braking to Portolotti on his way. Personal best in sector two, but it's half a second down on what would be the overall. So this is going to bring that 63 Lamborghini potentially, potentially into the top ten. Getting news in the pit that it was an ABS failure, which is why he locked up and had the big scare. Yep, I mean, these cars run ABS. You can adjust the ABS to be either aggressive or non-aggressive. And when you rely on things electronic uh, and they go wrong, it, it, you do get caught up. So Portalotti comes past, goes 20th quickest on the one, 48.6. And the other lamb in that really, really is what he didn't want. Manages to get cleanly through. Probably hasn't lost a huge amount of time, but... It's only eight minutes remaining, and I don't know what the rubber he is on, whether it's got any more time in that set of rubber or not. So it's be a disappointment for the 63 Lamborghini and the Glasgow Racing Team. I think I found the one that's missing, and I think it's the Nick Thomas and Louis Macchio's Andrea Bertolini, a of course a Ferrari. Well, they were. I thought they had gone out at the start. We saw certainly we saw the car in the garage at the very yeah. beginning. I'm struggling to find them on the timing screen, and I'm. Mm. I don't think I've seen much of it on track, but equally, I can't think why it's not out. That's why well, I'm decoded to go and have a look for. OK, I, I, thought, I thought we said that car had gone fourth quickest earlier in the session. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Traffic coming down, and then you can see now just how much the light has dropped in the last 15 minutes. Everybody now running, well, virtually everybody running, well, the lights are now coming on pretty much all round. So headlights not necessarily required in terms of the driver vision, but mandatorily there will be a level at which lights will need it to be switched on. There is the 63 Lamborghini coming down into Parabolica. So personal best in sector one. 1.4, the 0.4 off in sector two. So the middle sector not brilliant for Mirko Portolotti, but might be sufficient to see a further increase. He was in 20th position. 
is up, in fact, up to 14th, so improvement. Getting there, he wants to be in the top 10 clearly before this yeah. session comes to an end. We've got Mauro Engel up to third, six minutes are on the clock. Where is Bortolotti to then? He is 14th, and he is looking at being only 0.648 of a second off the top. I mean, it's, it's pretty narrow, but the magic second exactly to the thousandth, one second, covers the top 20 cars. Delighted to see it. Delighted to see it because what we are looking at, I don't want to be an arbiter of you know, potential bad news, but what we're looking at now could be the grid yeah. for the start at 3 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. Could well we, be. Hope, we hope that isn't going to be the case. We hope that qualifying Sunday morning takes place, whether it's wet, dry or whatever, and that will then form the grid. But in the event that the rain is sufficiently heavy or the track conditions are sufficiently poor, then this could be the grid. Now, Bortolotti has done another personal best look, so he's gained a couple of tenths, he's gained another tenth in the second sector. It's going to be an improvement unless he makes a mistake. And how much of an improvement it is, he's now got to find uh, seven tenths because other people have gone quicker. Just pushed him down the order a bit. Well, he's going to get a little bit of a slipstream coming into Parabolica, but he'll lose a little bit from the effect of the Lamborghini just directly ahead of him. So the nose will want to push slightly wider. That car peels off, so that's actually been a salvation for him. Yeah. A lot of he's benefited from the two, so he might see a further improvement from 14th up to 10th. It is indeed. Yeah. So with four and a half minutes of the session remaining, has he fulfilled aspirations second time around? Or is he going to go, as I think he's backed out of it a little bit, he's not looking quite as aggressive or racy out of the first chicane. We'll wait and see, we'll get that first sector time coming up shortly. 34.2 was his last lap, his best lap and best sector time in sector one. 35-0, so it's fractionally slower. And I would imagine that this is either an in-lap or an easy lap, just to hopefully help the tyre recover a little bit, and then he will have the best part of the but just over two minutes to go. So Bortolotti might get another chance. And after that real flurry of shuffling, now there are far fewer improvements to be seen. And the Andrea Bertolini car has been confirmed as not going out. We don't know why. I don't remember anything sinister happening early on in the day. No. But it might be a deliberate decision. We don't need to go out. But they're going to. Well, it, it seems odd to give up the track tyre, I have to say. Uh, Manuel Lauk has just improved. Number 33, Manuel Lauk driving the Rinaldi Ferrari, the surviving Rinaldi Ferrari, that is. He's 30 second fastest. There is Bortolotti, who on this lap is down in one and down in two in terms of the sector times. Yeah, I mean, you can see the car is carrying the pace that had previously done, so he's going to come. No. So that lap was a little bit, and he's coming into the pits indeed, so not really terribly surprised. And that's the end of the day for the 63. Yeah. Could have been a little bit better, could have been a lot better, other than what turns out to have been not a mechanical problem pri primarily, it was mechanical led by electronic. Sensors on the ABS sometimes do go wrong. It's a horrible sense when you, you know you've got a, a brake that's going to stop you, and then all of a sudden what it's meant to do doesn't happen. Yeah. But luckily there's plenty of space. The worst aspect of it was you know, one front tyre clearly has been pretty destroyed, and therefore that tyre set uh, will only be used when extremists. The house only have to go away and get rebalanced if it's even possible to rebalance it. Well, two minutes on the clock, we're almost done, aren't we? Because the pit lane is getting busier and busier. Many drivers now electing to bail early. You don't have to go out in this session. It's not a regulation that you must go out, in fairness. So the uh, AF Corsa team uh, may have a plan, but it's just to seem odd that were this to set the grid, they'd be at the back of it. Good to see an improvement from the 32, or from the 33 Ferrari in 32nd position, personal yep. best, first and sector, first and second sector. So light comes up, so that will be... Well, 
stage 30 seconds. So, so, so it's probably going to be an improvement 49.246 yeah. against the 49. Well, see, clear. So it's a, a better lap time, time, but no less than the position. Stage 30 yeah. Second, yeah. So flag imminent, just over a minute. There's another with the Black Falcon fleet. That's the Hubert Howard car. Vastly experienced is Hubert Howard. Way up the curve as well as Hubert Howard. Carrie Moshe's car, the BMW, was at the foot of the times, but has just improved. And, as I say, the AF Corsa 52 Ferrari has been out. Teammates. Very priest-like looking beard. Mm. Banson Abril has um, grown over the winter time. And Raffaele Marcello, of course, pretty happy, I think, with their day's work car. Provisionally, but one would have to say quickest in the session, 36 seconds remaining. I would be somewhat surprised if another car eclipsed the 147.645, the quickest lap we've seen throughout uh, the running, the two days of running here at Monza. Jean Luc Bobelique there, who is the ACA within ACA ASP, goes over to say well done. And the flag, as I say, is imminent because there are effectively 10 seconds now. And the flag will be out in three, two, one, now, which will confirm that the 88 Mercedes is the fastest at the end of, again, an interrupted session. But what we've got a bit more to talk about, certainly in that second half. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a session where people were very beginning to focus on lap times rather than going through the, the role of doing somewhat more, but in terms of what you see on screen, I would describe as the, the, the tedious stuff of doing duration running and trying to find a pace which you can, can maintain over 15, 20 laps between whatever the number of driver changes, what's going to be three drivers, so it'll be roughly an hour each for the three drivers. There, the checkered flag. And how many cars are out on track? Well, there's still about half the field who are going round in one form or another. Yeah. Bentley just comes across the start finish line just in the background of the picture. There's the 1 1 1 Mercedes. They go back into the Aka SP. Drivers will now do a little bit of homework. Michael Meadows and Vincent Abril in discussion with. I think they're all probably pretty happy. Yeah, Michael and Raffaele made a good combination last year, I mean, and uh, Vance and Abril is certainly a good addition to the ranks. The thing that's key to me is that they've got a quarter of a second advantage over Marco Mapelli in the Lamborghini, and that's a quarter of a second when you consider that the top 20 cars are covered by a second. That's is, is, is significant. Agreed. That's one of the Attempto Audis that has stopped right at the very end of the session. Yeah, down at the second chicane. Yeah. So it looks like it's just pulled over. It doesn't appear to be any other reason behind the car being stopped up against the barrier. Drivers are required when there's a static flag and a car by the side of the track to go through that sector no quicker than their, their best time. Not everybody adheres to it, <laughs> no, but there we are. Indeed so. Right, well, there's from the... FFF Racing Team, 519, that's from Pereira's uh, car, fourth fastest. On the other side of the garage is second fastest, Marco Mapelli's. It's going to be interesting as well, isn't it, in terms of the, the rivalry now in the Lamborghini camp, because Grasso has had it all its own way. That's become the go-to Lamborghini team in Blancpain in Europe, whereas the FFF Racing Team won the Asian Championship, Blancpain GT Series Asia, last year. And now it comes to Europe, it takes on Grasso on Grassa soil, if you like. It's going to be interesting to see how that battle develops over the year. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> and it'll be interesting to see how, in the Grassa team, how they cope with a challenge. Uh, and this is a pretty strong challenge. Currently, second quickest and uh, significantly ahead of the Grassa at best is in 10th place. Absolutely. Well, at the end of pre qualifying, it is then the Raffaele March Yellow, Michael Meadows, and Vincent Abril Mercedes that's the fastest from the Marco Mapelli, Dennis Lind, last year's Blancpain GT Series Asia champion, and Andrea Caldarelli, uh, Lamborghini, Yelma Boom and Lucas Stoltz, Mario Engel third, from the Phil Keane, Giovanni Venturini from Ferrero, Lamborghini fourth, Simon Gachet, Stephen Palette, Christopher Hassel. That could be an interesting Audi to keep an eye to, that, in the 
23 hours tomorrow, and it's outpaced the Dries Van Thor, Ezequiel Perez, Compank, and Alex Rivera's entry. After that, the Honda, Matt McMurray at the end of the session was in the car, but Philip from Avila's time put it seventh, eighth, another of the Mercedes uh, from Jim Pla, the best, Aston Martin ninth, and Mirko Bortolotti only tenth. Keep on going, and you see that there's so much to look for in the race tomorrow because you've got people, well, in that session being out of sequence, and it could decide the grid depending on what the weather has in store for us. But the Bentleys struggling a little bit, both disappointingly far down, I think, those two cars. Uh, the Seb Morris Team Parker racing car, 14th, it was just on the earlier page. So the works cars outpaced today by the Pro-Am entry. Seb Morris doing a very good job. And as we said this morning, he's going to join the works team ranks, the M Sport ranks, for the Spa 24 hours. So that's going to be intriguing to see how he gets on there. Good single-seater gun, Seb Morris. Uh, keep on going, Garage 59 getting the Aston to 31st. It was higher up than that, then dropped away towards the end, or others went quicker and pushed it down the order. Rover Racing's got a bit of head scratching to do as well. One car in the wall, neither really looking as though, to use John's phrase, they've been at the races today, but over three hours. It was a Porsche that won the very first Blanc Pan Endurance Series races, it was then called here, the uh, Auto Orlando Sport Porsche. So we know they can be good around here, but that was largely on fuel consumption that it won that race. Uh, a very quick race it was. Ferraris with damage, including the 333 Rinaldi car. So it's going to be a very busy squad at work overnight. And it's a question mark over the AF Corsa number 52 Ferrari that didn't go out for reasons unknown. So it's Raffaele Marchiello who does the best time with Vincent Avril and Michael Meadows as his co drivers. And they are in the pit lane. So too is Dakota. Guys, the fastest boys on track at the moment. Raffaello, beautiful time. Yeah, it was uh, a good pre quali We'll see tomorrow if it looks like wet, so I think it was good to put um, a lap time today because you never know what happened tomorrow. And yeah, the car was was really good. All of three did uh, a good job for now. I mean, the weekend is, is starting tomorrow, so we will see, but it's a good start for sure. Michael, could you be ready for the rain tomorrow? Yeah, we had some practice yesterday and um, we looked OK. So, you know, if it's going to be as much rain as they say it's going to be, it's going to be tough for everyone. So qualifying could be a bit messy. It's about just starting in the front and see what we can do in the race. Fastest in pre-qualifying. It's going to be a long day tomorrow, though, Vince. Nice to see you joining these two very quick boys. You must be happy to be in the car with these boys now. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> it's uh, Obviously, it's a great start of the year. Um, first official session and we're P1. So... Uh, good job by uh, Lelo, and uh, I think all three of us are happy with the car. We had a good day yesterday. We're having fun as well, and uh, I think that's the key to it. Are you guys showing the full potential of your cards? Or are you still keeping something in reserve? I think when you see the way we're pushing now, uh, it's difficult. It's hard to say we're not pushing. So yeah, we're flat out, and I think everyone is right now. So. Rafi, any more in it? Full potential. Maybe Michael has something else. We'll see. It was, a good, it was a good lap time, you know, as you can see by the, the sectors watching me watching do it. But um, yeah, now we just have to, we've done some work. Now tomorrow the real work starts. Good luck for tomorrow, boys. We'll see how you go. So the three Mercedes drivers walk away with uh, thoughts now on a wet race. We've had wet Monza races in the past. We've had bakingly hot Monza races in the past. But... It's uh, going to be uh, a tough three hours if it's wet tomorrow. Right, let's have a look at the highlights then of pre-qualifying. A lot went on, and ultimately it was Mercedes that topped the times. Everyone got ready uh, for the start of the session, knowing the importance of the 90 minutes because of the weather forecast for tomorrow, meaning that this might set the grid. But we had an early stoppage. Florian Schultzer went off the road, looped it, and distracted by that, Dennis Bulatov came around the corner and found that Actually, the wall was where he didn't expect it to be. Uh, off went the Rinaldi car. That was out of the session. And Schultzer, undamaged, uh, was able to uh, he'd been pulled out of the gravel, drive back to the pit lane. We also had the Rover Porsche going off the road. And in between the interruptions, some decent lap times were being posted. And going into the race tomorrow, we've got a Mercedes at the top of the times. Mirko Bortolotti thought he was going to be on for a gun effort. Well, but for an ABS problem, he might well have been. But he went up the escape road. That compromised the challenge. And so he ends up uh, a further down in the order on that session. Right, we'll see you tomorrow for an all-action day from John Watson and David Addison. Bye-bye.